Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our midweek Bible study at Deadridge Baptist Church. We're continuing in the first letter of Peter. I just want to say how much I'm enjoying the study of this first letter of Peter. I feel when I come to you midweek, I'm, I'm bringing really the fruit of what has um, excited and enthused me, uh, the thoughts that helped form and sustain the early church. And here we have them in Peter uh, for us, a living word, breathing life into us and our fellowship life today. Well, I'm, I'm going to be presumptuous and say well done for managing to stay positive uh, during our time of lockdown. Uh, I don't know about you, we're beginning to hear more and more comments about the eventual easing of restrictions and I find each comment, no matter how small, uh, a little deposit in the bank of hope. And so I'm looking forward uh, to us being together again uh, back at the church. But in the meantime, uh, let's bring our, our meeting to the Lord and pray his blessing upon it. And then we shall read the passage for this evening and reflect on what it says. So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity this evening to come before you to study your word and to find, Lord, in our study, our faith strengthened and our, our, our hope uh, made more resolute as we look out to you and all that you have done for us and for our salvation. We're in 1 Peter. And our prayer is that you will take what Peter penned and what the Spirit inspired into him, that you will take that and make it live for us, live for us in our various settings this evening. We want to hear you speak into our lives and situations. And so, Lord, unstop our ears, open our minds and hearts and lives to the uh, pure spiritual milk of this word and may we grow thereby and mature into those you're calling us to be. So be with us Lord we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Well um, our passage this evening is 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 to 8. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 to 8. It's entitled in the NIV the living stone and a chosen people. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Right, well, as I say, we're in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 8. Please have your Bible open in front of you so that when I refer to different uh, words or phrases, you can just check them out and uh, see that I'm, I'm not getting things wrong. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems a tremendous leap of imagination for Peter to go from babies and their milk in verse 2 and stones and a house in verse 4. I mean, could any pair of objects be more different? I find it's leaps of this sort that can make tracking the progress of some ideas in the New Testament a little bit hard for me, and I think a little bit hard for us modern readers. But actually, to a Jew of that day, uh, the leap from babies to stones, or a house, is a shorter leap than we might think. There is a connection, and it's a very Hebrew connection. An illustration is found in Genesis 16 and verse 2. It's where Sarah gives her maid Hagar to Abraham in the hope 
that, and she says, I shall have children through her. Well, actually, in the original, it says, I shall have children, or literally, I will build a family through her. I will build a family. So to obtain children is to become a house. Think of the house of David, for example, when it's mentioned in the Old Testament. To become a house is to have been built. So the progression from babies to building or living stones would seem really quite natural to a Jew, although to you and I it seems a strange connection. But in these verses in Peter, Jesus is calling the church both a building and a family, if that now makes sense to us. But notice the two key characteristics of this building or family. That's what I'd like us to consider in the short time we have this evening. The two key characteristics of this building or family. First of all, um, its foundation is the living stone. And that is to say, not a living stone, the living stone. Now, what is intended by this title? Well, Peter quotes Isaiah 28 and verse 16, which clarifies this point. At the heart of the passage is the thought of the temple. And this was, of course, where people met with God and they with him. But Israel, because of their sin and because of their disobedience, as we know, went into exile. Now, exile was not to be forever. The prophets announced that God would restore his people and rebuild his temple. And so Isaiah writes, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Now, Peter quoting Isaiah tells us that Jesus is that sure foundation, the foundation stone of a new temple. He is God's chosen instrument through whom the restoration of the people and the rebuilding of a new temple would take place. Now, when Sheena and I were in Jerusalem last year, we stood at the western wall of the temple. And I couldn't help think of the time in Mark 13 when the disciples said to Jesus, in the temple precincts, mind you, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. But in John chapter 2, in the temple again, Jesus adds this, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. He was speaking of the temple of his body, of course he was, but he was also identifying in his own death and resurrection the old temple's demise and a new one to be born, and that is the church. Of course, the church built upon the foundation that is Jesus Christ. Now, isn't it um, so exciting to see that what God is doing in Jesus is so thoroughly rooted um, in those promises to Israel uh, way back. Uh, and, and to see how the promises are fulfilled beyond anything that we would naturally imagine. It's quite extraordinary. Um, the church is, if you like, uh, the, the renewed Israel. Um, it is those to whom the prophecies ultimately were directed, uh, the church becoming in Christ the new Israel, the people, as it were, purchased out of exile by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And him realising that when he was in the temple and talking about his own body and the dying and rising um, that would entail and include just people like you and I in the Christian church two millennia later. And so we wonder at this. It's an exciting thing. Uh, but something else is equally exciting. The temple structure is of living stones. So its foundation is the living stone, but the structure is of living stones too. Peter says in verse 5, You also, 
like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, two points need noticing. First, in the Old Testament, the temple was the place where God dwelt. In the New Testament, the people are the place where God dwells. They are living stones being built into a spiritual house. And so here the references are to God's spiritual presence in his people individually, their living stones, uh, but also corporately, their spiritual house. And so we must never think of the church as merely an institution or an organisation. It, it has been shocking to me, uh, coming out of educational leadership into the church, to find the very same mindset occasionally and strategies employed occasionally by both education and the church in regard to its management and its growth. You know, the biggest truth about the church is that she is a spiritual house. God is in her. This is what marks the church out as a distinctive, in, uh, a distinctive body. Um, God is in her. And the proper human response to this has always been not to organise and strategize church into something better, but to hear God speak to her through his word and by his spirit and then work through her by prayerful, worshipful and obedient responses. I find this such an exciting thing. You know, the church is not an institution or an organisation, but as I'm sure you've heard um, and, and heard again and again, she is a living organism because God is in her. There are things true of the church that are not true of any other organisation or institution uh, on, the, on the face of the planet, and that is that God is present in her. And so just think of of, 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 of Paul telling them at Corinth, you know, you are the temple of the living God. Uh, and why? Because God's spirit lives in you. God is present and part of who you are and, and what you're doing and what he's doing through you. And so therefore, I want to encourage in you and I this high view of the church. Uh, we are those uh, amongst whom and in whom God is present. And therefore, our calling is to hear God speak to us. If God is present in us, we will want to hear him speak to us. Just as when an individual is present in the family home, people expect to hear them speak. And this is key for you and I. And we hear him speak. Maybe you are at this moment. I hope that you are. You hear him speak through his word and by his spirit as he makes that word live in our hearts and relate to the specifics of, of our callings and our situations in life and also work through her and work through you and I by prayerful, worshipful and obedient responses to what God is doing in the church. And so what a high view of the church. What a high view. And that's the view of the New Testament, where there is a, a, a group of professing individuals and God is not present. No matter how religious they are, they're not the church. Because the church is defined by the very presence of God, by his spirit, ministering his presence and purposes and then empowering and equipping us as a group of people to respond to them and carry them out. Isn't that a wonderful thing? What an honour to be part of the church of Jesus Christ in our day. It is a wonderful thing, an amazing thing. But secondly, in the Old Testament, priests served God in the temple in the New Testament, believers as a holy priesthood serve God as a temple, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, but through Jesus Christ. 
Uh, that's what Peter is saying. So sacrifices were offered in the Old Testament period, but so also are sacrifices to be offered in the New Testament period. Spiritual sacrifices. Now, what might some of those be? Well, there are clues to this in the New Testament. and I've come across um, five, and I'm sure if I were to have spent more time searching, I'd have found more. But there are five spiritual sacrifices that attention is drawn to in the New Testament. First of all, there's the spiritual sacrifice of praise. In Hebrews 13, 15, we read, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. I could almost see someone there mouthing the words as I began the verse. Continually offering to God a sacrifice of praise. Do we realise that every time we sing praise to God, we are as New Testament priests offering a spiritual sacrifice to him, a thank offering, if you like, through Jesus Christ. How much more this makes of the worship that you and I bring um, on any given Sunday. If we were talking about the wonder of the church and that God lives in her, now we're talking about what the church is called to do. And among them, these things that we are called to do is to offer spiritual sacrifices, and one of them being a sacrifice of praise. So every time we gather at church and stand to sing, we're addressing God. We're blessing God by this um, sacrifice of praise that we bring. And even today, the songs that we have been provided with as part of our online service, particularly on a Sunday, but even now during the midweek, um, these are spiritual sacrifices or thank offerings that we're bringing to God. I mean, how wonderful a thing is that, that we can relate with God at all as fallen and sinful human beings. But yet he allows this, uh, us to be um, priests in our day, offering these sacrifices of praise. It's incredible. Now, I have to admit that I don't always think of the hymns and songs that I sing as so significant. So I'm challenged by this. And when Sheena and I sit on the settee together and watch the Sunday service, and I manage to get over the fact that I'm looking and listening to myself, how I feel I need to respond to this is to remember that those songs that have been chosen and placed there by Ian for us are, are, are being given the means whereby we can offer spiritual sacrifices of praise to our God and, and, and to regard them with the significance that we should. But there's more. There's always more, isn't there? There's more. There's the spiritual sacrifice of prayer. In Revelation 5, the elders, I'm sure some of you will remember, are holding golden bowl, fo bowls full of incense, which, although they speak of, of temple offerings, are also, we're told in verse 8, and I'm sure you know it, the prayers of God's people. That, that incense is considered the prayers of God's people. So every time we pray, we are offering a spiritual sacrifice. Our prayer is part of our worship and part of what we bring to God. And if you say in what sense is, is prayer a thank offering, well, of course, we come with our own concerns and the concerns of the fellowship and the concerns of national life, particularly at the moment. But we come and buy those prayers display and affirm before God our profound dependence upon him for everything we need. We come as creatures in prayer before the creator. We come really as those like Adam in the garden, discovering a need and, and petitioning the father that that need might be met. And so prayer is a spiritual sacrifice. It is a blessing to God in the sense that um, every little child that comes to their father uh, needing his help is complimenting the father, bringing, as they do to the father, that sense that they need him and wouldn't be able to cope without him. And surely that underpins all prayer, no matter 
who it is or what it is we're praying for. But prayer is a spiritual sacrifice, a thank offering to God. There's also the spiritual sacrifice of ourselves. Now, what do I mean? Well, Paul talks in Romans 12 and verse 1 of offering our bodies as spiritual sacrifices. I could almost hear some respond to me there, by which he means offering ourselves to the Lord for his service. In Philippians 2 uh, verse 17, Paul talks about himself as poured out like a drink offering. And so there is the spiritual sacrifice of our very selves. The thought seems to be that of the personal consecration of ourselves before God, the yielding of ourselves before God uh, uh, for his purposes. It's like saying, in addition to praise and prayer, I offer myself, Lord, I offer myself. I've, I've offered my lips as I've sought to sing and praise you. I, I've brought my tongue as I've sought to to pray and to thank you for all the blessings uh, that, that you bring up, uh, upon me. But now I'm bringing my whole self, my body, and asking that you will receive it as a spiritual sacrifice, a thank offering, and something that you can use uh, to bless yourself. But there's more. There's also the spiritual sacrifice of kindness. Now, I love this. In Hebrews 13, 16, the writer exhorts readers, do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. The spiritual sacrifice of kindness. Let me read it again. Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Now, isn't that wonderful? Those little acts of kindness are considered sacrifices to the Lord, spiritual sacrifices. When we, we think of another and we act in, in, in ways at times that will seem really very insignificant, but yet are little acts of kindness done to lift the spirit and encourage another. These are not just uh, little incidences of, of, of our regard and affection. They're spiritual sacrifices. Kindness itself is a spiritual sacrifice. I'm challenged by that. And then finally, there's the spiritual sacrifice of giving. In Philippians 4.18, Paul says, I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you have sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Now, there's a thought. Our very giving on a Sunday, when we're gathered in the fellowship uh, and the offering plate comes round and we give our gifts, we are, by the giving of those gifts, making spiritual sacrifices to God. They are fragrant offerings, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Now, of course, at the moment, we're not gathered uh, in the church building and haven't been for some weeks. Uh, we meet twice a week as deacons, and on one or two occasions, the, the, the subject of finance has come up. And obviously, we have a little concern because uh, not having sent the offering plate around, um, we are uh, receiving a little less, maybe significantly less than we once did as a fellowship when we were gathered. But I want to encourage you to set aside, if you can, those monies that you would normally bring and, and, and offer on a Sunday, remembering that those monies are, are, are not just the excess or, or a small percentage of what we didn't need in the week. Not at all. They're not so humble. Rather, they are the spiritual, acceptable sacrifices, fragrant offerings that please God. And so I would therefore ask you, in setting those monies aside, to take that matter seriously, so that when we're gathered together in, in, in due time as a fellowship, 
and worshipping as we've always done, there will be that great fragrant offering and spiritual sacrifice made that means uh, we can balance our books once again and sort ourselves out. But all the while, um, this is no mere financial um, uh, adjustment. It is the offering of a spiritual sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice of giving to our God. <clears throat> well, um, what a wonderful passage. Uh, and I'm sure you must agree, there is so much, it seems to me, in 1 Peter. Uh, let me remind you again of those spiritual sacrifices. Praise, prayer, our very selves, the kindness that we show others, and the giving that characterises our commitment to wider fellowship life. To remember that we are living stones. What defines us as New Testament, New Covenant Christians is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. God dwells within us. And how important is that? But our foundation stone is who else? The living Lord Jesus Christ. So all those sacrifices we mentioned, we offer through him as our foundation. Um, what a wonderful passage. Well, we're going to come now uh, to a time of prayer where we remember and petition the Lord. So we're coming to offer a spiritual sacrifice to give thanks for all his blessings, for the way in which he has preserved us over these weeks. If we had contemplated all these weeks that we were in lockdown with um, limitations upon our freedoms, we would have despaired. But here we are after many weeks and the Lord uh, we trust has kept us buoyant and encouraged by his word and by his presence in us. So we're going to give thanks for that and pray as we do for our hospitals and for those that are suffering uh, because of this virus. So let's pray together. Our Father God, we want to thank you this evening for the way in which you have watched over us, that you have preserved us, you have kept us from harm, uh, you have maintained for us, Lord, uh, a lively sense of your presence. And as we've turned to your word, uh, your spirit has allowed us to drink from that uh, precious milk and that it has so encouraged and uplifted us at times, Lord, when we would otherwise, given our human situation, have felt like despairing. But you have kept us and protected us and provided for us and you sustain us by your word and by your spirit and as a fellowship together lord this evening we want to say thank you thank you thank you now lord we do remember one another because we are conscious that uh, we do live now during a situation that is taxing and challenging and and we want therefore lord to pray uh, for ourselves as a fellowship, that as we go forward, uh, we might learn what it is to be content in you and learn what it is each day to look to you for the strength and encouragement that we need to prevail. We also pray, Father, for um, the hospitals that we, we uh, generally remember in prayer before you, the Western General, the Royal Infirmary and St. John's here at Livingston, we continue to pray for all the medical staff and support staff that are constantly at work in these three hospitals. Uh, we just pray your blessing upon them and pray, Lord, that everything they do uh, to, to heal uh, others uh, will be um, as instruments in your hands and that the outcome uh, of all their efforts will be favourable and that we will see fewer and fewer people losing their lives to this dreadful virus. We pray for families too, Lord, uh, some of whom I'm sure feel quite tortured by the circumstance that they're presently in, having those among them that are ill. And so, Lord, we remember the hospitals. We remember our nation. We pray for our First Minister. We pray for the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. We pray for their governments. We pray that you will give them wisdom and understanding. We pray, Lord, that you will help them as they seek to act um, in a way that will uh, mean the defeat of this virus and our gradual 
returned, Lord, to uh, some form of normality. Be with them, Lord, and enlighten them and give them wisdom, we pray. And Father, now, as uh, we conclude our time together, we ask this, that we may all of us continue with a sense of your presence near to us. I think of those words where I think it's Paul says that we might reach out and touch you because you are not far from any one of us. May all of us be conscious of your near presence. Um, and in that consciousness, may we know the peace that passes all understanding, guarding our hearts and our minds, our emotions and our thoughts at this difficult and challenging time. And so, Lord, we just conclude our time together now by thanking you for all your mercies and your goodness to us and your favour on all your people in Jesus Christ, the living stone. Um, in his name we pray and for his glory's sake. Amen. Amen. <laughs>